Hi, I'm Justin Moses, and today I'm going to talk about acquiring scar tissue. The good news is that I'm not talking about scar tissue resulting from some emergency medical procedure, nor am I talking about the scar tissue that comes from having some kind of nasty accident. I'm talking about the figurative scar tissue that comes from having spent decades in the trenches as a corporate warrior. And don't let me overstate things here. I've had the privilege of secure, long-term employment with organisations that genuinely cared for the well-being of their people. But even in those environments, there can be challenges caused by factors like changing corporate strategy and the wider economic cycle. And meeting those challenges invariably needs strong, decisive, sometimes unpopular action that can leave its own scars on the leaders whose job it is to take that action. Now let's be honest, we've all compared scars, right? Maybe as kids, maybe as adults. Because our war wounds do speak to our sense of having endured, having shown resilience. And we've all seen the action movie trope of the hero dramatically removing his shirt to reveal scars that suddenly explain to us how they came to be so stoic, so capable of enduring everything that is thrown their way. Popular music is full of references to scars as well. And one reference that I particularly like because it speaks to what I call the teaching power of scar tissue was penned by Australian singer-songwriter Missy Higgins in her song, Scar, where she sings, So that I do remember to never go that far, could you leave me with a scar? The teaching power of scar tissue. That concept is really what got me thinking about this talk. You see, I have an amazing job. I'm the sole in-house lawyer at AIM Mentoring. We're an indigenous, not-for-profit corporation that has a mission to eradicate educational inequality in Australia and around the world. It's a young organisation staffed almost entirely by young, passionate mentors who believe that to change the world, you have to change the way that it works. And you do that by giving those who are regarded as the problem the tools and the belief to demonstrate that they can, in fact, be the solution. When I went for my interview at AIM and was talking with the deputy CEO about taking on the in-house lawyer role, he explained his deep belief that what the organisation needed was some people who had accumulated some scar tissue. People who had done things that this young organisation was yet to do who had achieved, of course, but who had also failed, had made mistakes, had learned from those mistakes and had moved on. Carrying some scar tissue, perhaps proudly, perhaps humbly, but certainly no longer likely to make those same mistakes again due to that teaching power of scar tissue. Now, I honestly hadn't ever thought of myself in that way but I reflected on my career to that point and I decided that I was ready to bear my scars and tell the stories of how I had gotten them if it came down to it. So just over two years down the track and I've got three examples of where I think those scars have allowed me to demonstrate the teaching power of scar tissue in delivering workplace lessons. The first involves protecting an organization's reputation. Now, most of my career was spent working for a major Australian bank. At its worst, I've seen times when the branch staff of Australian banks were reluctant to wear their work uniforms on public transport because of the abuse that they were being subjected to by members of the public. Not because of anything they had done, but because of what their corporate leaders had done. And those of us whose job it was to manage the consequences of those unpopular leadership decisions had to firstly 
reconcile them with our own and with the organisation's value systems, and then find ways to explain how and why those decisions were made and whether they would continue to be made in the same way. We had to be ever vigilant for the negative spin that might be put on any or all of our actions by agitated stakeholders. Fast forward to AIM and our leadership might say that I've been conditioned to be hyper vigilant when it comes to reputational risk because there have been situations where I've been very concerned to draft preemptive media statements, low on detail, strong on playing things down, to ward off the first probing questions of inquisitive journalists trying to sniff out a story that could lead to our reputation being damaged. Not because I felt that we had done anything wrong or had acted in a way that we couldn't justify, but because I was wary about losing control of the narrative. You see, I'd been scarred in the past by overlooking potential reputation risk, by not having the early warning system that allows you to deal with emerging issues proactively and take the wind out of the sails of those who might be looking to sensationalise a story. This was the teaching power of scar tissue in action. Reputational wounds take a long time to heal, if they ever do. And even though, as it turns out, AIM hasn't really been challenged by the media to explain any of its actions, we've at least been armed with a calm, reasoned position that we felt confident would shut the issues down. And we've raised awareness across the organisation of the fact that no matter how much you're trying to achieve for the greater good, in fact, sometimes for the very reason that's what you say you're all about, there can still be those who are striving to dispel that impression and damage your reputation. My second example relates to dealing with the vagaries of regulation of your business. Responding to shades of grey in an environment where there can be uncertainty and ambiguity. Once again, I'd moved from a world of significant regulation, although many commentators believe that still more was needed, to a world of comparatively little. But I bore some scar tissue. From trying to influence, trying to interpret, trying to advise, trying to protect, and while sometimes succeeding, certainly failing at other times, sometimes not really knowing either way, but, le but being left wondering if some almost forgotten skeleton might emerge from the regulatory closet. So my approach at AIM, one that I'm happy to say the organisation has fully embraced, has been to work really hard on clarifying regulatory ambiguity and to always have a reasoned recorded statement of our settled positions on regulatory compliance one that allows us to welcome a regulator into our organisation if they ever come knocking on the door. And while ultimately we might not end up with a better result in terms of operating our day-to-day -day business, any wound that we do suffer will be the result of a more clinical incision. This is the teaching power of old scar tissue playing a role in saying, even if you have to suffer a new scar, don't let it be like an old one that you had no say in. My final example relates to the need for an organisation's leadership to own unpopular but necessary outcomes. They might be decisions about strategic direction or about the prioritisation of applying limited resources. Often they're about people and are decisions which have a significant impact on employees' lives. Sometimes the context surrounding their decisions makes sense to the team. But sometimes the decisions are second-guessed and outright criticised, albeit on the basis of inaccurate impressions or incomplete information very often. But the leaders charged with making and implementing those decisions need to get comfortable with not being able to explain their merits in detail and claim that they have universally fair application, because sometimes they simply don't they can produce unfair outcomes at the individual level. And the leader can't avoid the cuts that cause the personal scars. 
the leader can't say, well, I didn't agree, but I had to do it. Or if it had been my decision, the leader needs to say that they have been part of the decision and that they support its implementation. And while in this example, it may not be possible to avoid the scars, the healing can occur more quickly, especially when decisions are fundamentally values-based and delivered with compassion and kindness. COVID-19 imposed a significant resourcing challenge on AIM in terms of keeping our team intact. In the end, it exposed us to reputational, regulatory and leadership decisions that many in the team had not faced before. But we made values-based decisions founded on consultation. We listened, we empathised, we accepted criticism, but we stayed the course. Some of us with old scar tissue didn't have our wounds reopen. Others, hitherto unblemished, are at different stages of dressing their wounds and healing. But we are all of us stronger from the teaching power of scar tissue.